Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Times flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgbeer conducts thought provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello. Every year on June 21st, millions of people in an estimated 84 countries observe the International Day of Yoga. Yoga was first introduced in the United States in 1863, but it wasn't until the 1930s that it slowly became part of American mainstream culture. Today, yoga is considered a meditative practice that falls within the global mental wellness industry which is estimated to be worth over $120 billion. According to this week's guest, America is becoming a nation of yogis. What's more, the adaptation of ancient Indian wisdom into modern Western culture and the incorporation of yogic methods into the spiritual landscape have been more transformative than people realize. How and why this came about is the topic of today's show. My guest is spiritual counsellor, meditation teacher, public speaker, workshop leader, writing coach and ordained interfaith minister, Philip Goldberg, whose books include American Veda, From Emerson and the Beatles to Yoga and Meditation, How Indian Spirituality Changed the West and The Life of Yogananda, the story of the yogi who became the first modern superstar guru. Philip Goldberg, welcome. Thank you. Good to be with you, Sandy. You too, Philip. Now, you've said um, uh, when you um, opened American Vida, the first words that you said were, in February 1968, the Beatles went to India for an extended stay with their new guru, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and it may have been the most momentous spiritual retreat since Jesus spent those 40 days in the wilderness. So, Tell us why you say that. First, I have to say that when I wrote that and when it uh, found its way into the opening sentence, I thought, I'm going to get a lot of blowback on that. <laughs> remembering great great that, opener, though. <laughs> remembering when you know people were burning Beatles albums you know, because of things John said. Um, no one's ever argued with me. And I found that fascinating because quite the opposite happened. Oh, yes, that changed my life. You know, I, I would get feedback from people reading American Veda that, uh, especially baby boomers, that, oh, this was the story of my life. And when the Beatles went to India, everything changed. And it's true. It was a watershed moment of in the uh, historic meeting of East and West that I think future historians will look at as a very uh, important development in the 20th century. Uh, the Beatles, at <laughs> younger people may not be able to relate to this, but you know, in the pre-social media, pre-internet era of 1967 and eight. Um, Mass media consisted of, you know, syndicated articles and newspapers and magazines and television. And the Beatles were the most famous artists in the world, probably the foremost famous, among the foremost famous people in the world. And everything they did was news. Everything they did was imitated and emulated by young people. And so when they went from their sort of hippie psychedelic image to sincere spiritual seekers who learned to meditate in 1967 and took up with Maharishi and learned his uh, transcendental meditation, it was news all over the world. And young people especially said, well, if it's 
if John and George you know, can do it, I can do it. Too. I want to do this too. And, you know, it was just, to many, it was just, you know, like wearing your hair like they did or wearing your clothes like they did or liking their music. It was just something to try. But for many people, it was life changing. And then when they went to India, the media from all over the world descended on this, you know, little holy town of Rishikesh in India uh, because the Beatles were going there. And, you know, there were cover stories in magazines all over the world and interviews with them on, on BBC and American television and everywhere else. And it was huge news. And, and part of the, th the thought was, why would these fabulously wealthy individuals who could do anything they wanted if they wanted a vacation, why would they go in to a funky little ashram, uncomfortable place in India? What is going on here? What is this meditation thing? What does India have to offer? What does a guru like Maharshi have to offer? What is, what's going on? And that's when people started to look more seriously at the yogic repertoire that was coming to us from India for nearly a century at that point, but had not been a mass media phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Yogananda had come a generation or two earlier, and there were celebrities who were followers of his, but they were opera stars and symphony conductors, and there was nothing like rock star status at that time. This was the Beatles. And it set all in motion a series of phenomena. First, young people and counterculture types taking up meditation, especially TM in, that, in those days, in huge numbers. And that led significantly to people like psychologists and medical researchers saying, what is going on when people meditate that changes their lives for the better? Because it was obviously happening. And so they did studies. And then the very first studies that came out about what happens to the body when people and the brain yeah. when people meditate um, made big news and you know published in scientific journals and a whole series of experiments followed from that so six seven years later meditation had gone mainstream and it wasn't just young people and hippies it was and a, sort of avant-garde artist types like rock musicians it was uh, middle-class, middle-aged people who wanted relief from stress and anxiety and so forth. And now it was being recommended by doctors. Uh, and that changed everything. That brought in all that India had to offer into the mainstream. And next thing you knew, uh, physical practices of yoga were popular. And here we are today. So and it was a watershed are. moment culturally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's an incredible industry now. Uh, meditation's being taught in many schools. Um, and, you know, I was looking at some statistics earlier that are just uh, mind-blowing how many um, meditation and yoga centres there are in the USA. It's just, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. But what were you doing at that time? I know that you said that you first set, on your spiritual path back in the 60s. Um, mm -hmm. And at that time, I mean, was that before or after this explosion with the Beatles? It, it overlapped because I started searching, much like, you know, George Harrison had been, you know, because there's a whole series of events with George and India and Ravi Shankar that led mm -hmm. to that moment. Um, you know, and I was younger than than the Beatles, but, you know, a student at that time. And I was, um, I had no religious or spiritual upbringing at all. It was totally secular. And I was a 
political activist in school, but I was very discontent and I started questioning everything like, you know, it was very typical of certain people in my generation. And somehow I found my way through books um, to Eastern philosophy. And I, I read all these books about Zen and Buddhism and Taoism and yoga and Vedanta theory and, and all this. And it was obviously, if you read those things, that there were methods, there were yoga methods, you know, especially meditation, that uh, you didn't have to believe in. But if you did, they had a sort of empirical basis, and it might be transform transformative. And so I experimented. And then when the Beatles put uh, that transcendental meditation into the mass media, I was very snobbish. And I said, well, you know, that's a trend. I won't do that. But I succumbed at one point. And about uh, three, four months after the Beatles went to India, I, I tried TM and it worked for me very well. And it, it was transformative and it did have life changing impact. And so I got deeper and deeper into it. And a couple of years later, became a teacher of it and did that for a number of years. But it, it, it was the beginning of a spiritual revolution in my life. And I'm typical of a you know, large number of people of similar age uh, from, you know, who came of age in the 60s when that all transpired. And so when I wrote American Veda, um, that generation and, and that era uh, loomed very large. Hence, I started the book with it. And then I went back and covered the whole history. But that, that's, you know, I was a seeker. I wanted truth. I wanted uh, ways to live a better life. And I wasn't finding it in the mainstream culture. Uh, so I was lucky and I found my way to the Eastern wisdom that made a lot of sense to me and, and uh, worked. <laughs> and so uh, that meeting of East and West and how these teachings came here and were adapted to the Western culture uh, in the U.S. and in Europe uh, became a fascination of mine. Well, long before the Maharshi, as you said, there was Yogananda, and before him, there was Swami Vivekananda. Vivekananda? Have I got that right? Vivekananda. Vivekananda. Okay. And Vivekananda. Um, say that again. Vivekananda. Vivekananda. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I've got that one. I won't say it again. <laughs> the Swami, I'll call him. Um, Swami. And both of those, they met with so much prejudice when they were oh, yeah. when they came to America, and they had many many problems. Do you think that it was solely because of the Beatles that something changed in the sixties and people were more open, or do you think that even without the Beatles, you know, the consciousness was changing anyway? The consciousness changed. You know, if you just look at, um, you know, when when Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and Swami Muktananda and Swami Satchidananda and all those gurus of the 60s started coming here. It was right after immigration laws changed in America so Indians could come eat more easily and become citizens and stay. But it was the civil rights era. And the, you know a lot of the people drawn to the gurus were the same people who had been working for civil rights and the anti-war movement and all that. So um, racial prejudice had shifted a great deal in the law and in the culture, uh, it, starting, you know, in the, even in the 1950s, but especially in the 60s. So what they faced, and they faced discrimination and, you know, prejudice and bigotry too, but it was not on the same level as what someone like Yogananda would have faced in the 1920s or 30s, or what Vivekananda would have experienced in the 1890s. I mean, when, when Vivekananda came and made a splash at the uh, 
Parliament of World Religions in Chicago in 1893, very few people in America even knew Jews. And, and people were discriminating against Catholics. It was a very Protestant country, and there was very, there was a lot of uh, ignorance about other religious traditions and racially. You know, needless to say, it was only if it was less than thirty years after our Civil War, and so you know, um, he, he, a dark-skinned man in orange and long hair would, you know face a lot. And when Yogananda came in 1920, I mean, it was a different era. The, K the Ku Klux Klan was in ascendancy. He, he spent his first four years in America in Boston, which was a very sophisticated city in one way, but also racially very backward. Um, there was discrimination against uh, all kinds of uh, ethnic and religious groups. And and especially African Americans, and so here he was again, a dark-skinned man with long hair and and uh, orange clothing, a monk, representing what people uh, of a certain mindset would have thought was a heathen, a, you know, primitive religion from India. Mm -hmm. And they, thought, so, but there's always been two kinds of people in America, and probably the UK, uh, who. One group of people is open-minded and embracing of differences and uh, new things and new people. And they came to see Vivekananda. They came to see Yogananda. And in the 60s, in huge numbers to see the gurus who came. And they welcomed them. And they said, oh, you know, what have you got to teach us? Oh, I'll, I want to hear what these wise men from the East have to offer. And they, you know, people stepped up and gave them places to live and fed them and, you know, did all the rest. But then there were the other people who were threatened by outsiders and foreigners and otherness who uh, there was a backlash. You know, they, they were doing the work of the devil and they were trying to seduce American women and, you know, with their evil ways and. So we, we had there both. Was also, there was also, I mean, the 30s, the 40s, you know, there was a lot going on. There was the Depression. Uh, there were the wars. People really, yeah. you know, the, the public, um, their focus had to be on survival in many cases, especially during the Depression. Yes. So uh, I would imagine many of them just couldn't even give it their time of day. Yes. Uh, and, and that's why uh, in those difficult times, uh, Yogananda was the main Indian teacher at that time. He, he was the first of the series of gurus to actually make America his home and his headquarters. And, you know, he was opening centers in different places in the 1920s and, you know, operating uh, his international organization or what became an international organization out of uh, Los Angeles, and it's still to this day, more than 100 years, almost 100 years later, still run out of the same place, and it's huge. But in his day, um, you know, automobiles were just coming in, radio was just coming in, airplane travel was just coming in. He, he crossed the country many times by rail. And, um, in the 30s, when the Depression hit, uh, you know, they could barely pay their bills, his organization. So he had it tougher than the gurus who came in more affluent times in the 60s, when young people like me could afford to, you know, go off on a meditation retreat. And when jet travel had made it easier to get around and all that. But, you know, the earlier teachers had a much rougher go of it, especially. And, you know, when I wrote the biography of Yogananda, it was very clear. You know, he taught here through the 1920s, what we call the Roaring Twenties, then the Depression hit, and then the war came. And he taught through all those eras. And it, it, there were difficulties, to put it mild. Why did you write the biography? I mean, we've had the autobiography. Um, yeah. which which is a beloved book, 75th anniversary last year. 
I mean, yes. sold millions, never been out of print, I imagine. God never. knows how many millions it's sold. Um, it was... Why the biography? The autobiography of a yogi was one of the most uh, significant spiritual books of the 20th century and probably the most significant when it came to the transmission of India's spiritual wisdom to the West. It, you know, I, I read it in 1970. Uh, I still have that copy. And many, many people like me were influenced by it. Some became disciples of Yogananda. Some just learned from the book and found their way to other, other uh, lineages and so forth. It had a huge impact. So when I wrote American Veda, Yogananda was a key figure in the book. And I got fascinated by his life story, um, but could only devote you know, one chapter to him and his influence. So afterward, I thought, that was a fascinating life story. Maybe there's a biography there. So I reread Autobiography of a Yogi. And I, I realized how much he left out. So much of the book is about other people. And there are sentences like, and three years passed in Boston. Or, you know, and I spent the next five years, you know, and I thought, well, what was, what are the details here? What's being left out? And so I started doing research and boy, I, you know, uncovered treasure troves of stuff that he chose not to write about in his own autobiography. And very few people knew about a lot of these things. So I decided, you know, I'll fill in the gaps. <laughs> and Did, less than 20, less than 10 percent of autobiography of a yogi is about his life after he comes to america and that was more than half of his life so there it is were you were you shocked by some of the things that you learned i mean how much he had to fight against yes i, I, I was not shocked when you realize the historical context but i was surprised I mean, there were lawsuits and, you know, salacious accusations and lurid yes. headlines in, you know, newspapers, um, you know, and threats to his life and well-being. I mean, you know, he was a British subject, you know, so what I just I also discovered that the, the Brits were spying on him because, you know, he might have been a, one of those independence movement subversives. Yeah. Yeah. So we mean yeah. bad things in, in, in the West. And, you know, so he, he had to overcome a lot. It was challenging. And there were times when he uh, publicly, well, not publicly, but in private letters and so forth would say, I, I may just, he, you know, I, I, I may give up this whole mission. I just want to be a humble monk and go back to India and live in a ashram or, you know, by the Ganges. But he had this mission and this calling, so he, he stuck it out. So, you know, his, it's a fabulously interesting life story. And not many monastics, not many people who take renunciate vows, as he did, write about their personal lives and their families and their struggles. And he did. Uh, and a lot of it, you know, <laughs> a lot of it was left out and now is in my book. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to take a short break now, Philip. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and my guest today is spiritual counselor, workshop leader, public speaker, author, and meditation teacher, Philip Goldberg. And we're talking about his books, The Life of Yogananda, The Story of the Yogi Who Became the First Modern Guru, and American Veda, From Emerson and the Beatles to Yoga and Meditation, How Indian Spirituality Changed the West. We'll be back with more from Philip Goldberg after this break. Home Times TV. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust spheric approach. 
Om Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Own Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Own Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Ohm Times flagship radio show, What is Going On? And as an author, editor, and 13 times book judge, who's read thousands of books and interviewed hundreds of authors, I'm constantly asked, what's really worth reading and what's not? So I created the No BS Spiritual Book Club to help you save time and money by picking the brains of discerning names who have walked this path before you. There's no catch, no fees, and no BS. Just an ever-growing library of 10 best spiritual book lists from some of your favourite authors and teachers, plus free book excerpts, audios and video interviews with people like Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., David G., Lee Harris, Mark Nepo and more. From well-known classics to hidden gems you've never heard of, it's the only no BS guide to the best spiritual books to enlighten your journey of self-discovery. So why not join the club? Get inspired and save money at the no BS spiritual book club.com. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back. <laughs> Philip Goldberg. Yogananda said that his autobiography would keep his legacy alive long after his passing, and he was right. You say that you believe Yogananda would want any book about him to not only inform, but also transform. Do you think your biography fulfills that? Well, I'll leave that to readers <laughs> to judge, but I hope it does. I hope I hope everything I write has that, you know, that kind of effect. Um, you know, anybody who writes seriously uh, about themes like this would like people to not just be informed, but transformed by what they read, even a, a little bit. And one of the things about the biography that I hope, and I and I've I've heard that from readers. Um, it humanizes a guru who, you know, people venerate yes. and, and think of as some, you know, godlike figure. But I wanted to focus on the human story because I've met a lot of gurus, I, you know, in my time. I've spent time with swamis and, and you know, many of them are worthy of great reverence and emulation and um, respect. But they're all human beings and they have different personalities and different backgrounds and different preferences and different senses of humor. And, you know, and they they know that <laughs> they recognize that. And I wanted to humanize Yogananda and by extension, you know, holy people who, you know, we often put up on pedestals yes. at our peril. The pedestals are too high and too, you know, a, a, we get a, too attached to them. And then, you know, it leads to disillusionment when you find out they're human beings. Uh, and then people like to put these people on pedestals and then they love to tear down the pedestals. And I just wanted to show uh, that even somebody of his stature as a spiritual leader had to struggle, had his heart broken, you know, had uh, 
got angry, uh, mm-hmm. and yet was a towering figure who, uh, you know, comported himself with utmost dignity and uh, worked very hard and, and you know, it had a complex life. And uh, that, I felt, was an important message to get out. And I've had a number of emails from devotees of Yogananda who were very grateful to, to get a more uh, full picture of the human being. And, and my hope is, you know, that anybody reading it will realize that we're all divine. And, and some people awaken to that divinity and become what we call, you know, enlightened or liberated, and they become leaders. But they're still human beings. And, yeah. and we, too, are still human beings. And we have to, you know, in living our own spiritual lives, also honor the humanness with all its idiocy. And <laughs> You're absolutely right. I read um, Autobiography of a Yogi many years ago. And for me, it was up there. It was, you know, very distant from me. I mean, a fabulous book. But I had him on a pedestal and thought, wow, you know, what an incredible life. Reading your book brings him closer to me and it also it also makes me think about myself um and it gives me courage to overcome some of the difficulties yes. in life i've also gotten that feedback and I, this is very meaningful to me it's like oh i thought you know as you advance in in along the spiritual path life would get easier and easier and more bliss and everything would be beautiful and rainbows would appear before me, you know, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then we all discover that that's true to an extent, but we all have our individual karma and life is always going to change. And sometimes we're shocked, especially when we're young and naive, like I was. It was like my life totally transformed when I took up meditation and and yogic practices in general. And then stuff would happen. And I'd say, wait, what? I didn't think it was supposed to happen like this. I just thought it'd get better and better. Why did I lose that job? Why did this happen? Why? Because life. <laughs> And, and we it comes as a shock. So when I get hear from people that, oh, now I see even someone of the stature of Yogananda had challenges and difficulties and things he had to overcome, it makes my own life seem more okay. If he yeah. can deal with that stuff, so can I. And yeah. if it happened to him, why am I complaining? Just like deal with it and move on with with dignity. And in that sense, he, he was a role model. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And in fact, you wrote a book about very similar uh, concepts there, road signs, navigating your path to spiritual happiness, um, in which you talk about the paradox um, of, of yeah. the journey uh, where we're told one thing and then we're told something else or we're told one thing and we experience something else yeah. because life in the world in our humanness is filled with paradox and change yeah. and contradiction and the whole universe is manifest that way and while there's the deepest part of us you know the core yogic message the core message of all the mystical traditions that there's divinity in us there's a part of us that is eternal and infinite and bliss that doesn't change. And the more we integrate that into our lives, the, the more of those qualities are expressed in our humanness. But there's still the humanness. And there's still a body that gets sick and sprains its ankle like, <laughs> you know, and uh, loses its hair and all the rest and there's the you know stuff of life you know of loved ones dying of people disappointing us of uh 
countries invading other countries and gas prices going up and you know all the stuff we have to deal with is still part of the human life and the integration of the the deep inner core into that uh, gives us more equanimity and more presence and more wisdom and deeper awareness but it doesn't necessarily mean all those challenges of human incarnation are going to disappear. We naively think that. I did. There's a, a, a passage in the Bhagavad Gita that um, meant a lot to me early on. It, it was essentially the promise of the yogic life of having equanimity in loss and gain, pleasure and pain, victory and defeat. And I said, I want that. And what I realized years later is somehow I misconstrued that to mean there won't be loss, there won't be defeat, there won't be pain. It doesn't say that. It says you'll have more equanimity in the midst of all that. Yes. And that's a worthy thing to aspire to and something that's attainable. And, you know, the, there's even data on that. You know, the more, the more, uh, the longer people practice yogic methods like meditation and, and the physical practices and so forth, the more likely they are to withstand stress and rebound more quickly and maintain their composure. But doesn't mean it'll be perfect. Just, you know, ask my wife. <laughs> well, it's, it, it's very easy, you know, um, to sit on our spiritual laws when life is smoothly rolling along. But when we hit the roadblocks, you know, uh, as many people have discovered these last few years with COVID, now with a war in the world, you suddenly, you know, realise it's, it's not always so easy. And yeah. we really have to dig deep in order to find our way through and which, you know, this is going to sound self-serving, but um, the, my most recent book is called Spiritual Practice for Crazy Times. I know, and I, I was start, going to get to that. <laughs> oh, okay. And I started writing that. It's usually, oh, there it is over my, this year. Um, uh, I, I started writing that long before COVID, but it came out just right after COVID hit. And so, you know, I added a paragraph to the introduction saying every, you know, people thought I was uh, prophetic, that I, I somehow knew this was coming. <laughs> Times were crazy enough, you know, a few years ago before COVID, and then they got really crazy. Um, and But one of the reasons I, I wrote it was because there were, I was hearing from people, you know, trying to adapt to crazy times that they either didn't have time for their spiritual practices because they were dealing with life, or they didn't think it was relevant because they had so much to deal with. And I thought, no, this is when we need these things the most. This is, you know, times are always crazy in, in our, you know, in our can be all crazy at any time in our lives. And then when we're, when it's really crazy, like during COVID or during war or any of these uh, economic distress, collectively, uh, this is not a sign that the practices don't work. It's not, they're not luxuries to be done only in good times. You don't stop taking the medicine because you're sick. No, that's, you know, when you, when you might need it. So I, part of the reason I wrote it, it was to give people a repertoire of practices to call upon uh, especially when life gets crazy and when life is good to, to keep doing them because then they'll be more part of your life when craziness erupts again. Um, and so one of, one of the reasons, you know, in your introduction, you noted that I, I say sometimes that we're, we're becoming a nation of yogis. 
And I've given talks and all that with that title. Um, and the reason I say it is, it's not just because yoga, as you know, we think of it now, the physical practices, but yoga includes many kinds of methodologies and uh, perspectives and ways of life. The centerpiece is you, you know, thought of as meditation and now you know, all the physical practices and the breathing practices, but there's also ethical and uh, aspirational philosophical elements to yoga. And if you look at American culture in general, and I would guess at least some European countries as well, and Canada, um, if you look at the spiritual trends in the data about people's attitudes and beliefs, you see ever since the 70s, really, and especially the last 20 years or so, a trend in, a, in certain directions. For example, a lot was made of the fact that fewer and fewer people identify with a religious tradition. There's more and more unaffiliated people, spiritual but not religious. Yes. Each time a survey comes, that's a bigger population uh, percentage of the population, younger people especially. There's more people in that unaffiliated category now than there are Catholics and evangelicals in America. So why? What does it mean to be spiritual and not religious? When you look at what they mean by that, by being spiritual, it means, for example, their inner spiritual lives, their inner spiritual experience is primary, more important to them than membership or affiliation with a, an institution or a group. It means they're independent in their seeking for knowledge and uh, experience. And they'll draw from whatever works, they're eclectic. Spiritual inner experience, unmediated, is accessible and a priority. That and, and other markers are all characteristics of what we think of as yoga, also of Buddhism, which has, you know, was very influenced by yoga. I'm just using the term yoga because it, yeah. it's non-denominational. It's, a, it's universal. And so we're moving in that direction. And there are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who are, in essence, yogis, because they are seeking what yoga um, points us to and gives us methods for attaining, namely union, the union of the uh, individual self with the yeah. The, the self of the universe, the, the emergence of the, the realization of the, the eternal and infinite within us. Yes, and, and, direct and experience. Direct experience and uh, integration into life. And that's what, yeah. you know, the essence of yoga is. And that's what many, many people are seeking consciously and deliberately, even if they never set foot on a yoga mat, never think of themselves as yogis, but they're spiritual seekers. And they may be sitting in a church pew or in a synagogue or in a secular meditation center or a yoga studio or a new thought church or any other place or just seeking and finding, you know, through the internet and books and, you know, gatherings here and there for deeper spiritual experience. So in, in the classic definition of the term, they're yogis. Yeah, yeah. They're yeah. people listening to us right now are probably thinking, oh, I never thought of myself as a yogi, but I guess I am in, in that sense. And that's the trend. And, you know, the, the access to the teachings of the East 
um, had a big role to play in this. But it's not just that, because if you go back and look at all of American history, there was always some of that. Yeah. The transcendentalists of the early and mid 19th century, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau. Yeah. Thoreau in, in Walden actually calls himself a yogi. And because he was reading books from India, there were no yoga studios <laughs> then. Yeah, but not then. That spirit yeah. of independent yeah. seeking and the primacy of inner spiritual experience has been part of American life forever. One scholar called it the religion of no religion. And so now it's a flowering because of the easy access and the internet and travel and everything else. And um, so that's the, the direction that the spiritual a future, I believe, has. And there'll be backlash. <laughs> yeah, of course there will. Yeah. I want to, um, because we are living in such crazy times and because you've written a book about it, um, I would like you to just share a couple of the tools and techniques from that. I mean, there's a um, couple of things that uh, I haven't particularly read that book. I've read the others, but um, one of the tools that you offer is how to spiritualize outrage and mobilize anger in the face of injustice. That's something that I think many, many people right now would give their eye teeth, you know, to have a technique for, because people are feeling it. So would I. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, I... Technique, I'm, I'm very big on technique. Uh, you know, meditation techniques properly taught, yoga techniques properly taught, prayer practices properly taught, chanting properly done, et cetera, et cetera. There's an aspect of spiritual practice, and, and you see this in yogic literature, of shifting the content of the mind and the mood the emotional content of, uh, of, of, of mind and body. Because anger and fear and all the other, what we think of as negative thoughts and emotions can be toxic and they can set you back and they can lead to bad decisions, regrettable words and actions. Impulses, yeah. But suppressing those or being in denial about those feelings can also be toxic, can also be destructive. So the methods are not about burying them, stifling them, because they're real and they should be on, you know, they have to be acknowledged. There's a lot to be angry about. Um, but as we've all learned, unfortunately, in our lives, the hard way, uh, anger can sometimes just make things worse. And it can eat away at you. If, and then if expressed inappropriately, can just lead to more trouble. You know, the proverbial, you know, yelling at the person who cut you off on the road and then you collide into a tree because you are you know, you're too angry. Or you say you say something in anger and then, you know, a, a friendship ends when it could have been handled differently. Um, part of it is the consistency of spiritual practice, because the, the you know, the more you integrate spiritual practices into your life, the less likely you are to make those mistakes, the more presence you'll have, the more, you know, less likely to succumb in the moment. You might have a little bit more awareness, a little more calm, a little more presence of mind, and therefore not make those mistakes. But then in the moment, if we catch ourselves, it's a question of shifting. And, and sometimes that takes time. It's like, okay, I am enraged. And one thing 
that's important to do is recognize that that feeling, those thoughts have a physiological component. And so doing something physical, sometimes just, you know, taking a brisk walk, you know, pounding a pillow, just getting out the toxic emotions physically can help. But so can just sitting and feeling it. And this is this is a you know something the has been long been known in the East, and now psychologists and physicians have done research on it. If you're feeling overwhelmed by emotion, if you just sit and feel it, and it's what we don't want to do that. We don't want to feel it, so we try to you know ignore it or deny it or suppress it. But if you feel it. And just feel the physical sensations and allow that feeling. It, it may feel like an eternity, but in a minute or two, the feelings start to diminish just because you allowed your attention to go to it. And then you might have the presence of mind to reevaluate. It doesn't mean you're not angry, but if you can shift from rage, which usually leads to a loss of control, and perspective to something more like righteous indignation. Like there's a problem here. What can I do to make it better? What's the best strategy? It doesn't mean you don't care. It doesn't mean, you know, it, it's to be ignored. It means you are shifting within yourself so that you can act in a more appropriate and effective yeah. way or choose not to act. That may be an option as well, but you won't react in the moment in an inappropriate way on the foundation of uh, uncontrollable rage or anger. You will, con you will be righteously indignant. You will care and you will have the presence of mind to act in a in an effective way we admire people like that we you know those of us who like sports we love those athletes who when the pressure's on they rise to the occasion they keep their calm inside yeah. and that's what we have to cultivate yeah yeah absolutely philip we've got about four and a half minutes left a um, couple of questions i want to ask you or things that i'd like you to briefly tell us about one is your um, podcast spirit matters that you co-host um what is that all about what kind of people are you talking to well thank you yeah spirit matters uh, and the, our youtube channel um we've been at it for five or six years now we interview people we probably put up maybe 50 a year and so we have an archive of close to 300 interviews with spiritual teachers, scholars, uh, people who represent traditions, people who are independent teachers. Many of them are very well known. We've gotten some, you know, the most famous current spiritual teachers on. And many of them are not well known, but ought to be better known. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we take great delight in uh, interviewing these people. Uh, it's all free. It's our form of service. As you know, try as we will, we have not monetized it. <laughs> and um, and so we invite people to go to spiritmatterstalk.com or the Spirit Matters Talk YouTube channel. And, uh, you know, you'll find tremendous insight and uh, inspiration and practical wisdom in the people from the people we've interviewed thanks for bringing it up you have said in the in the last minute or so that we have left um very quickly you've said that if religions focused on common experience instead of competing dogmas the world would be a better and safer place i'm sure that few of us would disagree with that is there anything that you would quickly like to add to that before we close Say, wait anything i can what you would like to add to that before we close? Oh, well, that's part of the becoming a nation of yogis business, yeah. because if, you know, 
I commend you to some of the interviews we've done on Spirit Matters about the what's called the perennial philosophy, which is, and this is a core message that has come from the traditions born in India, that there are many, many legitimate ways to deepen one's spiritual life and achieve you know, the, the oneness uh, and f- inner freedom we're all seeking. And everybody has to find their own path. And there's no one true way for everybody. And religions centered on spiritual experience find they have much more in common with each other than the than if you focus on dogma and yeah. all the outer stuff of religion where the differences are and the conflicts arise when you get down to deep inner experience doesn't matter what tradition you come from you have the same or very similar inner experience and when people discover that it removes a lot of the tension that's caused by religious differences. Yeah. Philip Goldberg, we're out of time now. Thank you so much for joining me today. What a pleasure, Sandy. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. We've been discussing Philip Goldberg's books, American Vader, from Emerson and the Beatles to Yoga and Meditation, How Indian Spirituality Changed the West, and The Life of Yogananda, the story of the yogi who became the first modern guru. For more information about these and Philip Goldberg's other books, visit his website, philipgoldberg.com, where you can also check out his courses, workshops, American Vader Indian tours, and his Spirit Matters podcast. That brings us to the end of this week's show. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'll be back at the same time next week with another edition of What Is Going On. Till then, it's goodbye from me. Mm-hmm.